We're getting there. We're almost up to five. So now we got six. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Got to have ten at least. Ten's the minimum. <laughs> Oh, I can't see him. Oh. <laughs> they, can they see me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's 25, you said? In the morning, it was usually around 25 to 30. Okay. Evening. All right, here we go. We got a Madunga player, I think. Yeah, your basics. <laughs> we got a person with a computer. Yeah. Two guys on the chair. Yeah, translation yeah. Department the translation department is there. <laughs> got a, I got a techie man to move the. Okay, we're all, we're all set here. Bhakti Siddhanta says, if nobody comes, preach to the walls. <laughs> Seven. Seven. No, there's nine at least. Five. Yeah. Somebody asked me today, what, what was Lord Chaitanya's dancing like? And I said, if you, would, if you could see it, you'd be back in the spiritual world. <laughs> I, didn't, I tried to describe something, but I couldn't answer it completely. <clears throat> if someone knows, you know. Hmm? If someone knows, you know. I know one thing. <laughs> He's known as Gore Nataraj, <laughs> king of all dancers. Kunjabi <laughs> Jar hard home, hard of all. Kunjabi Gary Bara Gary Vara, yet I go be Tanavala, Gary Vara, ah, yet I go be Gary Vara, he is so an undana, Raja Tanahan, He has sold a nun, Raja Janahan, Janayas. Jimun, a tear, a tear, a tear, a tear, a Head higher, heart, hum, heart of hum, couldn't shall be hard. Head higher, heart of hum, couldn't shall be hard. Hiya go be done of all above. Gary Barrett, Gary. Gary Barrett, Gary Vaughan, he is so an undone, 
Bhagavad Gita, 724, Knowledge of the Absolute Truth. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. It's a really a lengthy very lengthy purport, so I'm going to, what we'll do is we'll just go right into the word for word. Avyaktam, non-manifested. Vyaktim, personality. Apanam, achieved. Manyate, think. Mam, me. Abudaya, less intelligent persons, persons. Param, supreme. Bhavam, existing. Ajanata, without knowing. Mama, my. Avyayam, imperishable. Anuttamam, the finest. Translation, unintelligent men who do not know me perfectly think that I, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, was impersonal before and now have assumed this personality. Due to their small knowledge, they do not know my higher nature, which is imperishable and supreme. Hmm. Purport, those who are worshippers of demigods have been described as less intelligent. And here the impersonalists are similarly described. Lord Krishna in his personal form is here speaking before Arjuna. And still, due to ignorance, impersonalists argue that the Supreme Lord ultimately has no form. Jamunacharya, the great devotee of the Lord in the cyclic succession of Ramanujacharya, has written a very appropriate verse in this connection. He says, Tamsila rupam charitam paramam vakrishtai Sattvena sattva kataya prabhavai chasastrai Prayakta daivam paramartha vidam matas chanaivam sura prakritya va prabhavanti bodum. My dear Lord, devotees like Vyasadeva and Narada know you to be the personality of Godhead. By understanding different Vedic literatures, you can now come to know your characteristics your form, your activities, and thus one can understand that you are the personality of Godhead Supreme. But those who are in the mode of passion and ignorance, the demons, the non-devotees, cannot understand you. They are, under, they are unable to understand you. However expert such non-devotees may be in discussing Vedanta and in the Upanishads and other Vedic literatures, it is not possible for them to understand the personality of Godhead. In the Brahma Samhita, it is stated that the personality of Godhead cannot be understood simply by study of the Vedanta literature. Only by the mercy of the Supreme Lord can the personality of Godhead be known. Therefore, this verse is clearly stated, not only are the worshippers of the demigods less intelligent, but those non-devotees who are engaged in Vedanta and speculation on Vedic literature without any tinge of true Krishna consciousness are also less intelligent and for them it is not possible to understand God's personal nature. Persons who are under the impression that the absolute truth is impersonless are described as abudaya, which means those who do not know the ultimate feature of the absolute truth. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it is stated that the supreme realization begins from the impersonal Brahman and then rises to the localized Paramatma, but the ultimate word in the absolute truth is the personality of Godhead. Modern impersonalists are still less intelligent for they don't even know or follow their great predecessor Acharya who has specifically stated that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Impersonalists therefore not knowing the supreme truth think 
Krishna to only be the son of Devaki and Vasudev or a prince or a powerful living entity. This is also condemned in the Bhagavad Gita 9.11. Everyone together. Avajanti mamudhaham anusimtam asvritam param bhavam agyanantam amabhutam maheshwaram only the fools regard me as an ordinary person. The fact is that no one can understand Krishna without rendering devotional service and without developing Krishna consciousness. The Bhagavatam confirms this. Atapi deva padam budyam dvayam prasada lesan ugrahita evahi janati tadvan bhagavan mahim nona chanya eko vichiram vichinvan. My Lord. If one is favored even by a slight trace of the mercy of your lotus feet, he can understand the greatness of your personality. But those who speculate to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead are not unable to know you, even though they continue to study the Vedas for many years. One cannot understand the Supreme Personality of God Krishna or his form or qualities nature simply by mental speculation or by discussing Vedic literature. One must understand him by devotional service. When one is fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, begin with the chanting of the Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Then only can one understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Non-devotees and personalists think Krishna has a body made of this material nature and that all his activities, his form and everything are maya. These impersonalists are known as mayavadis. They do not know the ultimate truth. The 20th verse clearly states, Those who are blinded by lusty desires surrender unto different demigods. It is accepted that besides the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there are demigods who have their different planets, and the Lord also has a planet. As stated in the 21st verse, Devan Devo Yajya Yanti, Mad Bhakti Yanti Mam Api. The worshippers of the demigods go to the planet of the demigods, and those who are devotees of Lord Krishna go to Krishna Loka planet. Although this is clearly stated, the foolish impersonalists still maintain that the Lord is formless and that these forms are impositions. From the study of the Gita, does it appear that the demigods and their abodes are impersonalist? That's a question. Clearly, neither the demigods nor Krishna nor the Supreme Person of God are impersonal. They are all persons. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has his own planet and the demigods have theirs. Therefore, the monistic contention that ultimate truth is formless and that form is imposed does not hold true. It is clearly stated here that it is not imposed. From the Bhagavad Gita, we can clearly understand that the forms of the demigods and the forms of the Supreme Lord are simultaneously existing and that Lord Krishna is sat chit ananda eternal, blissful, and knowledge. The Vedas also confirm that the Supreme Absolute Truth is ananda mayo Byasat, or by nature full of blissful pleasure and that he is the reservoir of unlimited auspicious qualities. And in the Gita, the Lord says that although he is unborn Aja, he still appears. These are the facts that we should understand from the Bhagavad Gita. We can understand how the Supreme Personality of Godhead can be impersonal. The impersonalist imposition theory of the impersonalist is false as a statement of the Bhagavad Gita are concerned. It is clear herein that both the Supreme Absolute Truth Lord Krishna has both form and personality. Omagyan timidandasya gyana jena silakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guruvena maha shri chaitanya manobis tam stampitam yena butale swayam rupa kadamayam dadati swapadanti kam namam vishnu padaya krishna prasnaya butale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami ti namine namaste saraswati devi Gauravani Pracharine Nivrishesha Shunyavadi Pasyatya Rezatarine Vanchakalpa Darubascha Kripa Sindhupe Pachapatitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha 
Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he was in the Jagannath temple <coughs> when he came in he saw Lord Jagannath and he fainted in ecstasy. He was still a young sannyasi. He had just taken sannyasi. He was more, no more than 24 years old. At that time, there was one very great uh, Sanskrit scholar and somewhat of an impersonalist. His name is Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, who was known for his scholarship in that area, in fact, he was probably the most reputed of all the scholars in that area. He was in the temple when Mahaprabhu came in, seeing this sannyasi faint. Uh, one of the guards thought he was just some, some sahajiya, just putting on some show. So he came with a stick and he was going to hit Lord Chaitanya. But Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya stopped him and uh, restrained the guard and then he took, he arranged to take the Lord to his home. The Lord was still in an unconscious state and he, although he was still breathing at first he seemed to be, have no show, no life symptoms but at one point in order to find out they put a little cotton swab underneath his nose and we saw the fibers of the cotton were moving so they could understand there was some life. So he took him to his home and then of course after some time, of course, the devotees were looking for the Lord, and finally they found him, and then they knew he was at the house of Sarvabhoma, so they also came. So the Lord stayed there, actually for about seven or eight days, and uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was really fascinated by this young sannyasi, because he never saw somebody so beautiful, and at the same time, to take sannyasa at the age of 24 was quite unusual, because the Vedic system teaches us that Usually you go through the different phases of life, and then when you reach the age of 50, then you retire from all material responsibilities, retire from household life, and you move towards what we say, vanaprastha, and then you uh, move to a complete renunciation. So it was fashionable, not fashionable, it was culture, and it was tradition to take sannyasa at a later age. But Lord Chaitanya took it at 24, he kind of defied the whole system. And of course, Srila Prabhupada was also criticized for giving his young disciples sannyas at such a young age. There was one young man who was 19 years old. He took sannyas. <laughs> I think I took it when I was 38. So, yeah, I was 38. Uh, so, 1986. So, yeah, I had to get off of myself, but anyway, back to the philosophy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when he, when he took him to his home, he was, uh, he started to, when Lord Chaitanya came to consciousness, he found that Lord Chaitanya had, was his mother, Sachi Mata was the uh, son of, uh, oh, who was that? I can't remember his name. But he was a good, he was a classmate friend of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Oh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, he was a great philosopher also. They were classmates. So the connection was made between Lord Chaitanya and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya through this uh, personality. Who was it? Vishwanath? No, not Vishwanath. It was something. I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, but now, <coughs> uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya decided that this young man, you know, he might have so much uh, devotion, but he doesn't have much knowledge. So I think I should teach him Vedanta. And the Vedanta Sutra was available, and he was a scholar of Vedanta Sutra. So he uh, basically um, said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, you know, I would like to read to you the Vedanta and, uh, you know, give you some understanding of what is Vedanta because you're a sannyasi and all sannyasis must know Vedanta completely. Otherwise, you cannot be a real sannyasi in the real sense of the word. You have to have that knowledge. So, 
The Lord agreed, and for seven days he spoke. And the Lord listened every day for many hours. But the Lord didn't say a word. For after seven days, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was, uh, was kind of a little puzzled. You know, here's this person. He's listening, I can see that. But he's not speaking anything. He's not asking any questions. So after seven days, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya finished his presentation. And he said, uh, you know, don't you have anything to say? Uh, what do you think? You know, he was probing him for some response. Finally, he said, the Lord said, well, actually, the Vedanta Sutra is as bright as the sun. But your explanations are like clouds over the sun. <laughs> that was his response. When Sarabhan Bhattacharya was practically shocked when he heard that. Oh, let me hear your explanation. And then the Lord started to explain that he was giving it, Sarvabhoma, from the impersonal view, that um, because personality is limited and impersonal is all-pervading and God is all-pervading, therefore God's original manifestation is, pers is impersonal. But he takes on personal forms in order to perform his activities. But actually, he is, in his original state, impersonal. And that's their philosophy. Because they say personality is in one place, in one, but impersonal can spread everywhere, just like the sun is localized, but the sun rays are all-pervading. They go everywhere. So, using that analogy, he said, well, ultimately, we have to understand that from impersonal comes personal. But Lord Chaitanya said well, you don't really understand the nature of spiritual personality. Material personality is limited, but spiritual personality, because it's spiritual, it's unlimited. So spiritual personality, just like the sun, is the source of the sunshine. And therefore, the sun rays come from the sun. Therefore, the per impersonal comes from personal. And therefore, just like you are a person, I'm a person, but we have so many energies that we use in order to live our life and accomplish all our, you know, desires. So there are energies, but we are a person. So in the same way, the energy is impersonal, but the personality is the source of the energy. Therefore, as we take it from the supreme sense, uh, what is that verse? Um, Ishwara Parma Krishna, Satchit Ananda Vigraha, Anadir Adir Govinda, Sarvakarna Karnam. He quoted that verse from the Brahma Samhita, that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his name is Ishwara, I mean, he's called Govinda. He is uh, Anadir Adir Govinda, he's Govinda, and he has no one is equal to or greater than him. Uh, Ishwara Samhita. Sarva Karnam Karnam, oh, Sachidananda Vigra, he has a form full of knowledge and full of bliss, and he is the cause of all causes. As there are two kinds of causes, there's a remote cause and immediate cause. The immediate cause is what we see, the remote cause is what we can't see. Behind all activities is the hand of the Supreme Lord. He is the remote cause for everything that happens. And so after explaining everything, uh, and Lord Chaitanya made an interesting point. He said, everywhere we see, everything is personality. So how can personality come from something lesser than itself? Just like you are a person, I am a person. And so we can say, we our source is coming from the supreme entity. So if the, how that entity can be less than its creation. So therefore, using that, that argument, we find that actually form is superior to what we say unmanifested form or impersonal or energy. So once we know that, then we can understand that God is, he can accept our offerings and he can also offer things in return. He has hands, he has legs, he has his eyes, he has faces. He has, in other words, he has form. He has a form, but 
his form is a little bit different than ours in the sense that it's he doesn't change bodies life after life like we change in this material world. His form is spiritual, therefore it doesn't change. That's when Arjuna was talking to Krishna. And Arjuna, Krishna was saying, you know, you and I were both here when I spoke the Bhagavad Gita 40 million years ago. You don't remember, but I do. Because I don't change my body, you do. So when you change your body, you forget. That's why we can't remember things from our last life. Because where our bodies are always changing from life after life. So, and of course, change of body means forgetfulness of our previous existence. But the Lord doesn't forget anything because he doesn't change his body. And his body is the source of all other, what we say, bodies. So we also have a form. We also have a spiritual form. We are not impersonal also. We're not just some energy. You'll see that there's many, uh, what we say, spiritualists that say you are like a bright light. <laughs> you know, come and see the light. The light will give you such happiness and you will feel illuminated. <laughs> but actually, what comes as light is the energy from the form. Just like in the, in the Sri Upanishads, in the, practically the 17th verse, I think, the next to the last verse, it says, my dear Lord, remove that effulgence so I can see your beautiful smiling face. Because the effulgence, it says that if 10 million suns were to rise in the sky simultaneously, that could be something compared to the effulgence of the Lord's body. So, you know, so when sometimes, therefore, the first form of God realization is impersonalism, where we can realize God is that bright light that per pervades all of existence. But that's just the beginning. Behind that bright light, there is a localized aspect of God where he sits in the heart of everybody, just like sometimes... How does God know everything, every place, all, at all times, with all living entities? Because he's right next to you. <laughs> he doesn't have to, you know, get on his computer and just see what's happening on the internet and then check out the different, you know, files that he has compiled. <laughs> has a, you know, he has a file on Ljubljana, he has a file on, on uh, you know, Zagreb, he has his file on Donald Trump. He has so many files. But he hasn't has to do that because he is right there with every living entity at every moment. So he knows everything about every living entity because he's always with you. And that's the second stage of God realization. To understand that God is localized. He's sitting in the heart. And he, Prabhupada said, Prabhupada had one of his artists, um, Jadarani, draw the form of the super soul. Both Merlidar and Jadarani combine together and draw a beautiful picture. You can see that. It's, it's yellow and red. The whole colors are yellow and red. And it's a form of the super soul. And Prabhupada said, he's nine inches tall and he sits in your heart. <laughs> so if you want to know how tall he is, <laughs> nine inches. <laughs> At least that's the form, and that's the size he takes, and he's sitting in your heart like that. If you get a chance to see that particular uh, painting, it's called the Super Soul. So you can see that Prabhupada had that commissioned by these two expert artists. So that's the second level of God realization, to realize Vidyaya Vinay Sampane Brahmani Gavi Hastini Suni Chaiva Sapakecha Pandita Samadarshanaha. One who sees every living entity, not simply by their body, but sees God in the heart of every living entity. Even doesn't matter what form that living entity has, God sits in the heart, even in the microbe, he's there. He can take any size in order to enter into the heart of any living entity. And this is amazing when you think about it, because that's the compassion of the Lord. He stays with every living entity, no matter what form that living entity takes. So he's in the heart of even the most tiniest of all. Yeah, that's the picture. Beautiful. Yeah. Maybe you can pass it around so everyone can see it. Super soul. Thank you for finding it. 
Um, so yeah, therefore, that's the second level of God realization. But the highest and supreme, and what is being taught by the Vaishnavas, under what we say, Lord Chaitanya's teaching, is God is the supreme personality of Godhead. He has an original transcendental form, an adir adir govinde. It's the original form, and that's Krishna. He has many forms that have many arms, but the original form is two arms. God's original form is only two arms, just like we have our form is two arms. Just why they say in the in the Bible, God, man was made in the image of God. They say that. So the God has two forms, two arms, and two legs, and that's the original form of Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Da. And that's the source of all other forms of the absolute truth or the personality of Godhead like that. And so you can't love something that is not personal. You can't love, you know, a white light. Oh, Mr. White Light, we have a wonderful relationship with you. Just brighten up my life. <laughs> it's not possible to love something other than a person. And God is the supreme personality of God. And therefore, when you speak of love, there has to be a person. Because person means personality and characteristics. So we have our personality, we have our characteristics. God also is the source of all personalities and all characteristics and all qualities. That's why you can say love of God and not love of white light or love of energy or love of some unmanifested form like that. That's why those who are impersonalists, and Prabhupada writes this in the first first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the impersonalists go back to material relationships because they don't have that loving relationship with the Lord. Because they think the Lord is impersonal, is therefore, because they can't develop a relationship with the Lord, they ultimately, again, fall back into developing, what we say, mundane relationships in this world. But devotees know that the personality of God is there and one can see the Lord. Sometimes Prabhupada, someone would ask Prabhupada, have you seen God? Prabhupada said, yes, you can go see him too. He's right there. He would point to the deity. <laughs> he, there he is. No, no, have you seen God? That's him. <laughs> he's there. He's manifested his form in the form of a deity, but he's still non-different than that form. And so one can develop loving relationships with the personality of Godhead based on the principle of similarity. So we are a person and God is a person. And he, well, he's a supreme person. And we, are, we also have transcendental form, which is covered by our material form. And that form is our eternal form, where we will eventually, when we reach perfection in spiritual life, exhibit our loving relationship with the Lord through that particular form that is. Sometimes people think, well, I'm a male, therefore I have a male form. I'm a female, I have a female form, like that. No, these bodies are changing. It's one minute, one year, I mean, not one year. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that one year. <laughs> one lifetime you're a girl or a boy, and then the next life you're a different, you know, so you change forms. You, sometimes you're, you know, Mataji from Slovenia, and sometimes you're Prabhu from Croatia, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, these forms are always changing. But our eternal form, which is situated within our heart, it's there, it's covered, is our eternal form. And therefore, in that form, we will exhibit our relationship in loving service to Krishna in the spiritual world when we reach that stage of what we say. Uh, free from all material desires and completely in love with the Supreme Lord, which is the goal. Like. So therefore, the impersonalists, if you meet impersonalists, they're pretty dry. They look unhappy. <laughs> Why? Because... They don't have any understanding of the personality of Godhead. And they say, of course, this is what Prabhupada was kept saying over and over. They say, uh, 
Impersonal takes personal form in order to perform activities in this world. So the forms that the Lord takes, according to them, is simply material, like the energy it is here. So that's when, when they see, when, a, when the Lord appears in his, that's why Krishna says, avajanti mamudham manashim tanamasvatam. Fools, he uses the word mudha, fools deride me. When I appear in my transcendental form, they do not know my supreme dominion over all that be, my supreme position. And then he says, Naham prakasya sarvasya yoga maya samadvitaha murayo avajana ti mo. What is that last line? Davyayam. They cannot understand me because I'm covered by my eternal curtain of maya and thus the, the deluded world knows me not, which is unborn and un, in, unchangeable. So that's both. He says that twice in the Bhagavad Gita. So devotees know that Krishna is a person. <laughs> but sometimes because we don't really relate to Krishna as a person, we rate the, relate him to him more like a um, uh, in other words, what's our relationship? We don't have a clear understanding of his personality. And so we perform our activities in a very mechanical way or in a mundane way. But when we understand that God is accepting every one of our activities, when we offer it with devotion, then we'll offer it in that mood. And then you can start to awaken to the personality of Godhead. He's there. He's always there in his personal form for the devotees. But for the de impersonalists, he's there in his impersonal form. <laughs> and therefore, they can't find full satisfaction. Okay, so these are some of the points. And, the, and then the verse in the Bhagavatam, uh, what is it, Tadvat, what is that? Uh, oh, what is that verse? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. That's, that's the verse, yeah. Uh, oh, it's a beautiful verse, so nice. Avajan, no, that's not it. Uh, I had it before and then I forgot it. Hmm. Brahmeti uh, paramatmeti bhagavati ete sabjite vadanti tat tat vad vidvans tat vad yaj avayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan ete sabjite and that these the absolute truth is one but is divided into impersonal localized personality like that. <coughs> Okay, so there's three levels of God realization. The devotees are interested in the personality of God. <laughs> See, the impersonalists don't want to serve the Lord. That's why they worship the Lord in the impersonal form. Because if there's nobody to accept your service, you don't have to worship anybody. <laughs> so basically, as Lord Brahma says, what does he say? <laughs> that verse in the, in the 11th and 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, uh, what is it? Avasuda Buddhaya Arunakichchena Padam Padam Adantiyada. Again, they fall down to their from their platform of high elevation. Why? Because they do not engage in service. They're envious. They don't want to serve the Lord. They want to, you know, take advantage of what the Lord can give, but without serving the Lord. Okay, so any questions about, yes, Mataji, you're leaving, don't go, huh, huh, oh, you're working it, okay, all right, come back, <laughs> thank you, thank you for finding the super soul, I've been looking for him for a long time, I can't find him. <laughs> Hare Krishna Mahesh, can you compare a little bit 
what is the essential difference between impersonalism, impersonalist and voidists? Voidist. Buddhists. What is the, what is their essential? Yeah. Voidist means that when you reach this, this stage of perfection, you enter into the unmanifested, unlimited nothing. In other words, you annihilate your existence. That is voidism. So that's, that's called nihilism or voidism. Um, what it means that is that when you destroy... Voidism basically are persons who don't even believe in the soul. Generally they're Buddhists. They believe that this material body is not you, but somehow or other... See, material life indicates suffering. So voidism means to stop the suffering by voiding out your material existence and becoming nothing. So if you're nothing, you don't have to worry about any pains or pleasures. So isn't that wonderful? You can become nothing. <laughs> liberation here, the same aim, no? Well, there's, there's different types of liberation. For impersonal liberation, it's called sahuja mukti. So there's two kinds of liberations merging into the bodily effulgence of the Lord and merging into the body of the Lord, the second one is higher. So what they do is they go into the effulgence of the Lord and they experience, this is more or less the Ghanis, and they experience a kind of freedom from all material suffering. And there's a state of bliss that goes on in that state. But because they are alone and life means reciprocation, can't be happy alone. Prabhupada said, if I put you out in the field and I say, just sit here by yourself forever, <laughs> you'll think, boy, I want to talk to somebody. <laughs> so that's, that's the, the liberation they get. And therefore, a runicurs chain of down, they fall down again, take up material activities, after the credits of their spiritual attainment has been exhausted. But there are Brahmavadis. Brahmavadis means that they understand, they have become Brahman, realized, but they can go higher. They can go to super soul realization and ultimately Bhagavan realization, just like the four Kumaras. They were, they were Brahmavadis, not, not impersonalists. And Brahmavadis are a kind of impersonalist, but they're not like the Mayavadis. They actually accept that Br Brahman realization is one stage of realization. That's all. They haven't reached Bhagavan realization and they're happy with Brahman realization. But as was described, that when they get a taste of bhakti or they come in contact with the elements of bhakti, because they're not envious, they take up bhakti. They're inclined to serve the Lord. And then they move forward to the higher stages of God realization. That's the Brahmavadis, but the Mayavadis, they're basically envious of the Lord. And therefore they don't serve the Lord, and they say ultimately, because we are spirit, we are also the complete spirit, and therefore the idea is to realize yourself as spirit distinct from matter. Brahma Satya Jagat Mitya, they say. So in that realization, um, they can go up, they can also go into the Brahma effulgence, but then again they fall down because there's no service. Do the, do the Buddhists worship Buddha? Well, if they're not, there's different kinds of Buddhists. There's Hinayana Buddhism, there's Mayayana Buddhism, there's Theravada Buddhism, there's Zen Buddhism. The diff there's some Buddhism are not impersonalism, like the Hinayana Buddhism, they worship Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin is a personality who in uh, China, or, and not China, what, what is that place? Hong Kong, I think he's they worship in that area. They are, he's, and that personality is female. And in other areas of the world, that personality, so they, they believe in the Bodhisattvas, which are their spiritual guides to lead them to Buddha, to what is called Buddha realization, or what is called full, what they call it, what they call it, nirvana, nirvana. But they're not. They can also understand that that the supreme is also a person. So they worship the bodhisattvas, you know, who are actually like demigods, 
who give them spiritual guidance in their in performing their different austerities like that. But most Buddhisms are Theravada views. Theravada Buddhism are impersonalists or voidists, and they believe they believe that there's no soul, there's there's no God, that this world is unreal, and ultimately, you when you reach freedom from all material activities and you merge yourself into the self, then you become nothing. <laughs> and what is Buddha for them? Um, well, actually, you know, Buddha, Buddha is actually Krishna in the form of tricking a certain class of men to worship him. So fortunately for some Buddhas, because they worship Buddha, they get a chance in their next life actually to take birth in a, in a more personalist atmosphere. But he's, he doesn't reveal himself as the Supreme Lord. He really reveals himself as just the perfect person. Mm -hmm. Saint. Like that, he's a, yeah, he's a self-realized personality. Self-realized, he's free from all. The life of Buddha is described. You know, he was a prince. And he was living in opulence. And, uh, but his parents didn't want him to see the material world, so they kept him inside the palace his whole life. But at the age of 27, he left the palace. And then he saw, he saw a dead, dead man. He saw a diseased man. He saw four different kinds of people. And then he realized that the world is miserable. He was living in this, what we say, luxury palace, and his parents were shielding him from that. So when he came out, he saw that, and then he left everything and started to preach, uh, what we say, that this material world is simply suffering. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And there's different kinds of Buddhism, Buddhists, but most of them are in are voidism and personalism. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, Marco. Uh, Maharaj, do you have any? Do you know any personal story that someone, someone goes from personal, from personal to impersonal? Because we see in Bhagavatam, there's always somebody who's impersonal, becoming personal. Let's say I have one friend, he was like, he was personal before. And then he said that, let's say this, this was one story, he said that ants came to his house, to some room. And he said, he was addressing, he, he, was, he, he said, okay, please ants go away. But he didn't address Krishna, he addressed the universe, just go away. And it happened, you know, and he was like, he had many such realizations and he, he finally concluded that, that it's, not you, it's not necessary to, to address God as a person. Yeah, but that doesn't mean God didn't do it. Maybe he just didn't tell him he did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's behind the scenes. That's all. <laughs> or just to move the material energy, you don't need God's energy. You can do, even even people who have some material power can do that. <laughs> I mean, people can lock himself in a box with chains around it, throw it into an ocean, and then guy he comes out. You know, there was a famous you know magician called Houdini. And they would do that, and as yogis, they can defy the material energy. And they can produce. And, you know, something they call Prapti City. Just, they just meditate on something from a, something that's somewhere in the world, they can meditate on it, and by that meditation, they bring that object to them. It's called Prapti City, if you know it. There's, there's 18 mystic powers, eight, eight primary and 10 secondary. And Krishna speaks the whole 18 in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But at the end, after explaining all 18, he said, it's just a waste of time. <laughs> Krishna won't tell you, don't do it. He'll explain everything about it, then he says, don't do it. <laughs> he wants you to, to renounce in knowledge and not simply like children, you tell them not to do it. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> That's how you deal with children. But when you deal with intelligent people, they want to know why 
they shouldn't do it. Like that. So Krishna explains these things. Like that. Please don't extend your feet like that yet. It's not so good. You can, if you sit cross and you can't sit cross legged, that hurts, huh? How about a chair? <laughs> Want a chair? <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're pretty much right at the end anyway, so you get the exercise soon. <laughs> All right, so yeah, these are how, you know, there's people who have tremendous mystic power, and so sometimes they have so much mystic power that they they convince other people that they're actually God. And people believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when Prabhupada asked, that someone asked Prabhupada, do you have mystic power? He said, yes, just see all of these devotees out here. Uh, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gamble. Yeah, that's mystic power. <laughs> Before they were doing all this nonsense, now they stop. He said, "That's my mystic power," <laughs> and that's that's pretty powerful. That's to get people to give up these things. Yeah. But there are examples where people who are, because they haven't reached the personal, they give up the idea of trying for the personal. That's why. It's not that they go from personal. Once you attain personal realization, you'll, you won't come back. <laughs> but because they haven't attained it, maybe they tried for it and they couldn't reach it, then they accept something less. Yeah, you know, what's the word? the The grapes are sour. The the uh, jackal is jumping, trying to reach the grapes high up, can't reach it. Keeps jumping, he stops and says, "Eh, they're sour anyway." <laughs> <laughs> and when you can't achieve something you really you want, then you then you criticize that it's not worth it anyway. <laughs> it's a way of justifying your, your own inabilities. Okay, so we'll stop here. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.